my main professional job has been as an astronomer and a space scientist, and I've been very lucky to have been working through several decades now, but each decade has brought exciting new developments. And if I look at what's been happening now, what I'm thinking about at the moment, one issue is the very beginning of the universe. Can we understand the Big Bang right at the start when we have only indirect evidence and when the physics is uncertain? And in particular, can we understand how much bigger physical reality is than the part we can actually observe? We can observe a huge volume, many, many galaxies, out to 13 billion light years from us, but there's no reason to think that that's all the physical reality. Any more than if you're in the middle of the ocean, you don't think that the uh, horizon you see around you is the end of the ocean. And we want to know how much further reality extends than the domain we can see. And almost everyone thinks it goes a great deal further, but it may go so far that all combinatorial options are fulfilled, that uh, there are avatars of us far away, making the right decision when we make the wrong one, etc. So that's a possibility. And even more interesting is that our Big Bang may not be the only one. There may be other Big Bangs, and they may give rise to universes, as it were, which are governed by different physical laws, because many of the theories of fundamental physics suggest that there are many different so-called vacuum states, and they can give rise to different laws. And this leads to an idea which makes some physicists foam at the mouth, but which I think has to be taken seriously, which is called anthropic reasoning. The idea that perhaps what we think of as the laws of nature are just sort of parochial bylaws. There are some deep underlying laws, uh, but what we see in the part of the universe we can observe are just local manifestations. And if that's the case, then of course they're not a typical manifestation because many of these universes will be sterile or stillborn. They will not allow complex phenomena to happen, no stars, no chemistry, no life. And we're in one that does allow these complexities. And to try and put on a firm footing, I think is a big challenge for the next 50 years. I won't live to see that done. Um, I like to um, uh, quote um, a dialogue after a talk which I gave in a panel discussion uh, with um, Andre Linde. And we were asked at the end, how much would you bet on this multiverse story being correct? And I said, on the scale, would you bet your goldfish or your dog or your life? I was nearly at the dog level. And Andre Linde, who's a real pioneer of this subject, who spent 25 years developing an idea called eternal inflation, he said he'd almost bet his life on this. And then when being told this, the great theorist Stephen Weinberg said he'd happily bet Martin Rees's dog and Andre Linde's life. And I think that was a few years ago, um, and uh, I think the opinion has shifted in favour of taking this seriously. I can give you some uh, uh, indications of this because in 2001 I hosted a conference on this subject in Cambridge and uh, uh, we held it not uh, in the university but in the barn of my old farmhouse at the edge of Cambridge. And then five years later we had another conference which was held in the Master's Lodge of Trinity College where the speakers stood in front of a picture of Isaac Newton. And Frank Wilczek attended both these meetings, and he gave the summary talk at the second one, where he said that uh, five years ago we were a beleaguered minority, whereas now he and I and others had led many other people into the wilderness, and here we were in front of Newton's portrait, taking seriously the idea that our part of the universe is just a tiny and atypical, atypical fragment. And this is a big idea. So this is a new sort of Copernican revolution, which I think is uh, very important. Um, but in fact, the other thing that's exciting now is, I suppose in a sense, another Copernican revolution, but on cosmically a much smaller scale. This is the realization that uh, our solar system is just one of zillions of planetary systems around other stars. In fact, we didn't know that these planets around other stars existed um, even 20 years ago. People speculate they did, but the first one was found in 1995. Um, but now we have literally thousands that have been discovered, and it's fairly clear that most stars 
are orbited by retinues of planets, just as the sun is orbited by the Earth and the other familiar planets. And many of these planets are very different from the Earth, of course, but enough of them are like the Earth for us to suspect that there are literally billions of planets in our galaxy. And remember, our galaxy is one of billions in the universe, planets on which conditions were rather like on the young Earth and where life could have evolved. Now, of course, saying a planet is habitable isn't the same as saying it's inhabited because we then get into biology and biology is a much harder subject than anything in the physical world. And even if we understand a planet uh, and we know that it's, it's got a geology like the young Earth, etc., we don't know how life gets started. In fact, we don't even understand how life got started on Earth. We understand Darwinian evolution from simple life to complex life. But what we don't understand is the transition from just complicated chemistry to the first replicating, metabolizing structures that we call alive. But the good news is that this subject, which was uh, relegated to the, as it were, too difficult box, by most scientists. Serious people didn't work on it except as a hobby. It now attracts the attention of serious people. So I'm optimistic that within 10 years or so, we will have an understanding for how life began on the Earth. And that'll tell us two important things. It'll tell us first, how likely was it? Was it a rare fluke? Or is it something we would expect to have happened on these other planets? which are rather like the Earth. And the second thing that these developers ought to tell us is whether there's something very special about the uh, chemistry of DNA and RNA, which all terrestrial life is based on, or could there be other kinds of life? Could there even be life that doesn't need water? Maybe there are planets which we wouldn't think are habitable, but which are. In our solar system, for instance, as the moon of, of Saturn called Titan, which uh, is at minus 160 degrees uh, centigrade and has lakes of liquid methane. It looks as though it would be a rather nice place and if life could live based on methane, not on water, then places like that would be habitable. These are questions that we'll be able to answer. Um, but also we might have some direct evidence for uh, whether planets have life on them because at the moment, we only have indirect evidence for these planets. We don't see them, we see them, or we infer them through the effect they have on their parent star. The best way to detect them is that if a planet transits in front of a star, then it blocks out a bit of a light from the star, so the star looks slightly fainter. So a signature for a planet is if a star shows regular dips and then another dip and another dip each time the planet comes round. And that is a method that has led to the discovery of thousands of planets. And from that uh, kind of evidence, you can infer how big the planet is from how much of the starlight it blocks out. And of course, what the length of the, its year is from how frequently you see the recurrent dips. So we have that kind of evidence. But of course, we'd really like to observe these planets directly and not just see their shadows as it were. And this I think we will be able to do for at least the nearest ones in about um, 10 years using the James Webb Space Telescope and using the next generation of big telescopes on the ground. In particular, a telescope which Europeans are building which is unimaginatively called the Extremely Large Telescope, the ELT, uh, which has a mirror 39 meters across not one big sheet of glass, but in effect a mosaic of 800 sheets of glass. And the James Webb Telescope and the ELT should be able to uh, um, identify the light from a planet, even though the planet is millions of times fainter than the star it's orbiting around, and tell us something about the atmosphere. Is there something especially green? Does it have oxygen? Is the atmosphere out of equilibrium, as Lovelock says it would be if there's life there, etc.? Those are the kind of questions we might be able to answer within 10 years. Um, and uh, uh, this is a very exciting development. Now, of course, that kind of observation is going to tell you um, if there's some kind of life. Um, but 
Of course, what most lay people want to know is, is there any advanced life, intelligent life? And that's a completely different question and more speculative, because even though we understand how on earth uh, life evolved over four billion years from simple proto-organisms to the biosphere that we see around us and of which we are a part, we don't know the extent to which that was inevitable and the extent to which there were contingencies. In fact, there was a big debate among uh, um, biologist Stephen Jay Gould thought there were lots of contingencies. He thought if you were to rerun evolution, and if the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out and if other things were different, then you might end up with a quite different uh, biosphere with no intelligent life. Um, Ernst Meyer, I think, thought the same thing. Whereas others somehow uh, feel that the evolution of life is um, uh, going to be um, uh, rather like happened on Earth and something will emerge with intelligence. And even though we're completely uncertain, I think it's such a fascinating question that it's worth using every possible efforts to see if we can find evidence for something artificial, something beeping, some apparent artifact or something which could not be natural. And that's why I'm very keen to support um, uh, Yuri Milner, a Russian investor, uh, who's um, put a substantial sum of money, $10 million a year for 10 years, uh, into the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And this will allow a much deeper search than has been done in the past. One day of what this search will be able to do will be equivalent in terms of depth to all that's been done up to now by earlier searches going back to Frank Drake, Carl Sagan, and other great pioneers. And I think it's worth a try. Uh, we don't know what to look for, but it's worth uh, uh, looking for any evidence for something which is artificial, a very narrow band signal, something which is beeping in a curious way, etc. Well, what do we expect to find? Um, my personal view is that if we find something, it is not going to be the sort of civilization that people talk about. When you look at, if we think of uh, what's happened on Earth, then there's been four billion years of evolution. And for a few millennia, there's been some kind of civilization, organized human groups leading eventually to technology and the uh, world we live in today. If we extrapolate, then of course the uh, extrapolation we get depends on whether we listen to someone like Ray Kurzweil or someone more conservative. But I think even though the rate of progress is uncertain, the direction of travel is pretty well agreed, and it's almost certainly going to be um, towards a post-human world where our intelligences will be surpassed by something which will either be genetically engineered from us or, more likely, is going to be some sort of uh, um, artificial, some electronic device which uh, has uh, not all human capabilities, but has uh, uh, robotic abilities and, and intelligence. And uh, some people say that will happen within a century. Others say it will happen within a few hundred years. And even if it takes a few hundred years, that, of course, is a tiny instant compared to the past history of Earth. And more important, it's a tiny instant compared to the long-range future because there are billions of years ahead for our solar system, maybe even more for the universe. And so the way I look at it is this, that um, uh, if you imagine a time chart for what's happened on the Earth, there's been four billion years when there'd be no manifestations of any technology, then a few millennia of uh, gradually expanding technology generated by human beings, but then, after that, maybe billions of years more, when the dominant technology, the dominant non-natural things, will be entirely inorganic. That therefore means the following. If we were to detect some other planet on which life had taken a course rather similar to what's happened here on Earth, it's unlikely that its development there would be sufficiently synchronized with the development here that we would catch it when it's in the, those few, few millennia when we got 
technology which is uh, controlled by organic beings like us. If it's lacking behind what's happened on Earth, then of course we'll see no evidence for anything artificial. On the other hand, if it's ahead, then what we will detect, if we detect any evidence that that civilization existed, will be something which is uh, uh, mechanical, which was machines. And those machines maybe uh, will not be on a planet because they may not want gravity, they don't want water, etc. So they may be in space. So I think if the Euromiller program detects anything, then it's likely to be some um, artifact which is created by some long dead uh, civilization. Um, and it's unlikely, therefore, that it be any kind of coded message intended for us, but it might be something which we could clear, clearly see was not something which emerged naturally, and that would in itself be, be very exciting. Um, to expand in a bit more detail about what's going to happen here on Earth um, uh, that might lead to this takeover by post-humans in some form, um, I, it leads to another fascinating question, which is um, the future for spaceflight and manned spaceflight. <laughs> uh, another of the things I've been fascinated by uh, since when I was young. I remember reading about Neil Armstrong and, and all that, and thinking at that time that it would only be 10 more years before there were human footsteps on Mars. But of course, but we know that what happened was that uh, the Apollo program was fueled by superpower rivalry. And when the Americans had beaten the Russians to the moon, they cut back expenditure. NASA. Uh, during the Apollo program is spending more than 4% of the US federal budget. It's now down to 0.6%. So it'd have to be a real step change if they would ever go back and uh, uh, do something that trumped what the uh, Apollo program had done. And of course, what we've seen in the last 40 years has been humans just going around in low Earth orbit, but huge developments in miniaturization and in robotic probes. Um, uh, let, think of the um, pictures we had sent back from Pluto um, just last year, here before last, from NASA's New Horizon. Pluto is 10,000 times further away than the Moon is, and we had these very clear pictures of it. And what was remarkable about those pictures was that they were based on 1990s technology, because the space probe had taken 10 years to get to Pluto, and of course, the design has to be frozen several years before launch. And if we think how uh, smartphones have evolved in the last 10 or 15 years, one knows how much better we can do now in sending miniaturized probes throughout the solar system. And that's what we do for science. But I still hope that people will go. But I think they will go not in the style of NASA astronauts. Um, they will go um, more in the kind of... Uh, um, mode being envisaged by uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX and these other private pioneers. They'd be adventurers prepared to accept high risks. NASA's man's program is so expensive because it was so risk averse. The shuttle failed twice in nearly 140 launches. Each of those failures was a big national trauma because it had been sold as something which was safe and routine. Test pilots are happy to accept a far more than 2% risk, and there are many adventurers who will be prepared to. People like uh, the guy who fell supersonic from a high altitude balloon, and is a British adventurer called Vanoff Fines, who at the age of 70 dragged a sledge across the Antarctic in the winter, the people like that. And they're the kind of people who will be the first colonizers on Mars. I think that's the way it would go. I don't think Elon Musk is realistic when he imagines sending people a hundred at a time for a normal life, because Mars is going to be far less clement than living at the South Pole, and not many people want to do that. So I don't think there'll be many uh, ordinary people who want to go, but there will be some crazy pioneers who will want to go, even if they have one-way tickets. And the reason that's important is the following, that I suspect that we are going to want to control here on Earth by regulation the application of genetic modification and of cyborg techniques on grounds of ethics and of prudence. And this links with uh, another topic I want to come to later, which is um, uh, uh, the risks of new technology. But if we imagine these guys living as pioneers on Mars, they're out of range of any terrestrial regulation. And moreover, they've got a far higher incentive 
to modify themselves or their descendants to adapt to this very alien and hostile environment. So they will use all the techniques of genetic modification, which 50 years from now will be, of course, far more powerful than they already are today, and also cyborg techniques, and maybe even uh, linking themselves or downloading themselves into machines. And so the post-human era is going to start probably not here on Earth, but it's going to be spearheaded by these communities on Mars. So uh, I think these are the exciting developments in, in space. Um, I don't think that people will go for any practical purpose because robots have become more sophisticated and all the science can be done by robots um, uh, just as well as by human beings in, in the future. Um, so humans will only go um, as a spectator sport or as an adventure. But the other thing that will happen is that by the second half of the century there will be huge fabricators up in space, able to assemble huge telescope dishes, solar energy collectors and things like that, maybe mining material from the moon or from asteroids. And uh, that, of course, is something which uh, uh, can run away because we get bigger, bigger machines making larger and larger artifacts. But I think that will happen and it may be controlled from the Earth, but it won't need humans up there. This could be done by machines, but this will be an entirely new technology which could be very important for us on Earth as a way of getting clean energy more efficiently, for instance. Mm. AI and generalized machine learning, of course, are topics where I'm a follower, I'm in no sense an expert, but it's clear that they are surging ahead very fast now. Some of the key ideas actually developed in the 1980s and 90s from a guy called Jeff Hinton. Um, but they've only been realizable because of the uh, greater um, processing power of modern computers. Because the learning which is done by these methods requires analyzing a huge amount of data. I mean, uh, for instance, the Google translation uh, algorithms, which are very effective now, uh, they are now done not by feeding in detailed information, but by letting the machine read not only millions, but even billions of pages of documents. And they use European Union, EU documents. They never got bored, so they read those in different languages, and eventually they work out for themselves the syntax of different languages. And the, the, the machines um, uh, learn by uh, crunching huge amounts of data, many, many books and pages, and they learn to recognize uh, cats and dogs by looking at literally millions of pictures, and they can identify uh, natural kinds like cats and dogs in, without being told. So they can uh, uh, learn for themselves without being programmed. And that's, of course, the big difference between the uh, uh, deep mind uh, computer, which played Go last year and beat the world champion, and the uh, IBM Deep Blue computer, which 20 years earlier had beaten Kasparov, the world chess champion. Uh, the uh, chess playing computer was programmed in detail by experts, whereas the uh, Go playing computer was not. It learnt itself by watching many games, analysing many games and playing against itself, and eventually managed to make moves which uh, um, puzzled even expert players, but proved to be excellent moves. Um, and, uh, and now a uh, computer is able to play poker very well, and that's again is something which uh, it learns itself. So there is this important development in generalized machine learning uh, which um, enables the machines to actually uh, uh, learn without being programmed in detail. And this is an important breakthrough, and I think we should rightly acclaim it. And I think um, we can expect very rapid progress because people sometimes say, uh, well, if you look at the history of AI, um, there have been these false dawns. There was one in the 1960s, um, and then there was another one in the 1990s, and now there's another one. Um, but uh, this time it is different, and the reason it is different is that it's got above the threshold when there's commercial interests and lots of money being thrown at it. In the past, it was just done by a few um, academics. And I know in this country the field was completely killed off because uh, um, a scientist called James Lighthill wrote a report saying it would never work and that stopped all the funding because it depended on small amounts of academic funding. Whereas now uh, it's clear that there are uh, lots of um, uh, major commercial sponsors for AI and this is, means it's not going to die and is going to develop fast. So I think this time it is different and uh, I I'm fortunate to have got to know some of the people in this field, I'm not an expert, particularly the, 
the people at uh, Google Deep Mind, which is a company based in London, and um, they are uh, very keen to interact with academia um, and also blur the boundary between academia and commercial um, work in two respects. First, they try to publish as much as they can in the open literature. They've had uh, papers in Nature, for instance, reporting on some of their breakthroughs, like the Go Plane computer, um, and they also encourage the uh, young people who work there to, to publish. Obviously, some things which are commercially confidential, but they try to be as open as possible. The other uh, feature of uh, uh, some of these uh, groups doing AI is that they um, realize that things are developing so fast that it's not premature to think about the need for regulation and perhaps for sort of um, guided, responsible innovation um, to make sure that things don't go badly wrong. And uh, uh, in this respect, they're rather like bi biology because the people who work on uh, uh, gene editing and all that, they've accepted for a long time that you need to have um, some kind of uh, regulations and try and enforce it. And so the people in AI feel we have to think about the same thing um, and try and ensure that uh, um, the um, uh, programs don't um, get loose in the Internet of Things or something like that. And also to uh, uh, try and think about the order in which we would like things to happen. Uh, if you think about future risks, it uh, depends on uh, whether A happened before B or A happens after B, and you want to try and ensure that things are done in the uh, best order. Of course, it's going to be hard to enforce this um, when there are many commercial pressures involved, but so far there has been a, a very interesting dialogue between those in academia um, and uh, those in the commercial world, and that's not just on the ethics, but also on the, on the science, because the other um, interest uh, is uh, uh, what's um, sort of exemplified uh, best by Dan Dennett, for instance, which is the, uh, uh, the nature of artificial intelligence and uh, the extent to which it is like human intelligence and the extent to which consciousness is part of it. Um, and uh, this is, uh, of course, a classic philosophical problem. And this is, I think, one context where the philosophers um, really can um, provide a perspective because uh, um, most of the, the techies and geeks come to these problems afresh without knowing the history of uh, these debates about what is meant by uh, the brain and dualism and all that. I think that not only do the AI people need to engage with uh, those concerned with uh, uh, safety and ensuring that um, uh, the regulation uh, is appropriate, but also there are clearly deep philosophical questions about what are the limits of AI, what will change if we have quantum computers, um, and uh, uh, to what extent um, are these um, uh, going to be uh, conscious beings? Because clearly they will have more and more human capabilities, um, and this raises the philosophical question of uh, t is consciousness an emergent property of any sufficiently complicated system, or is it something which is special to the kind of wet hardware in our skulls and the fact that we are linked to a, a body. Uh, this is a very old question and it's still an important question. And of course it has, um, uh, as we know from the movies, but it's a serious issue too, implications for how we should treat these robots when they're seemingly intelligent and what responsibility we have towards them, because um, most of us feel we have a responsibility to ensure that other human beings can exploit their potential, and even that some animal species can uh, um, exploit um, their, their potential and uh, are given the opportunities uh, that, that they need. And the question is, are we going to have to start worrying about whether robots are underemployed or bored? Um, as we would if they were things with a, a consciousness. We just don't know if we're going to have to do that. Um, and, and that's a very deep question, because, of course, the old question of um, how, how do I know you're not a zombie? Um, I only know by analogy you're, you're not a zombie. And uh, that's going to be true for the um, AI as well. Um, but I think it's good that there are some philosophers who take this seriously. Um, Dan Dennett is one. Another, actually, is my colleague Hugh Price in Cambridge, um, who's a philosopher of science, but he's also taken interest, and uh, uh, that's why we 
uh, starting up in Cambridge as an outgrowth of our Centre for Existential Risks, a new centre for the future of intelligence, which is going to try and uh, uh, address questions of um, artificial intelligence and also real brain science as well, from a philosophical and an ethical perspective. So I think there are some people, uh, indeed some people who carry a, a trade union card as philosophers who are starting to take this seriously, um, rather than those who have a purely humanistic background. We, we, we've got to ensure that, uh, um, that the, the public does uh, uh, know what's going on and that uh, there is some regulation and there's a big issue about uh, privacy and who has access to your personal data and all that and that's coming up in this country with medical records. Uh, can they be anonymized adequately? I mean, maybe uh, Ross Anderson talks about this and you probably heard him on the subject and this is a, a very serious issue in this country um, and, and elsewhere. So uh, we do have to address these issues. But uh, turning to the, um, to the risks, um, I think um, uh, we've got this new centre in Cambridge and we are really trying to um, do something which is uh, not done sufficiently. I mean, there are huge numbers of people thinking about conventional risks like um, carcinogens in food, low radiation doses and that sort of thing. Whereas these um, uh, high consequence, low probability risks which are coming upon us because of technological advances and because of the greater interconnectedness of our world are not being studied that much. And that's why uh, um, I and a few other people felt we should try and do do a bit towards this because even uh, um, uh, even if we can only reduce the uh, the risk of one catastrophe by one part in a thousand, the stakes are so high we'll have more than earned our keep by doing that. And it goes back to the uh, the book which I wrote about 13 years ago now, um, called um, Our Final Century, or Our Final Hour in the U.S., which uh, did address uh, some of these concerns. Um, and uh, uh, there were really two types of concerns that I addressed. One was um, uh, the collective effect that we are having as a species because of the heavier footprint we are making on the planet, because the more of us, more demanding of resources, and we are causing uh, changes to the atmosphere, the climate, and all that. And there's a risk of uh, uh, environmental tipping points, as it were. That's one, one thing. Uh, that is fairly well appreciated now, although it's underacted upon uh, still for obvious reasons, because the uh, uh, issues are long term and diffuse, and politicians focus on what is, uh, what is local and, and, uh, and immediate. Um, but there's a second class of threats, which I think was the most distinctive uh, thing I highlighted in that book, and which is, I think, stood the test of time quite well, which is that we are getting more vulnerable because the world is more interconnected, and small groups or even individuals are more empowered by technology. So, as I put it, the um, global village will have its village idiots, and they will now have a global range. And uh, this is uh, because uh, they are uh, empowered by technology. We see this in um, uh, cyber attacks. Uh, which can be done by just one geek, um, but they can have an international effect, and this is getting more serious. We're all aware of that. Um, and uh, there will be other threats as um, artificial intelligence gets more powerful and more, more diffuse. Uh, when we have the Internet of Things, we'll all be far more vulnerable, and there'll be an arms race um, between um, uh, those who are trying to um, prevent these sorts of attacks and those who are ever more ingenious in doing them. So that, that's one threat, the uh, um, bio, sorry, um, AI and cyber. Um, but uh, there's also the bio issue. Um, and uh, here, I find it very scary. I'm not a biologist, but uh, talking to them, I've, uh, I'm very scared um, uh, because of the very rapid developments and because the uh, techniques that are needed are um, small scale and dual use, available in many university labs, many industrial labs. It's not like making a nuclear weapon, which needs large and conspicuous special purpose facilities. Um, so um, this, do, this does worry me. And some people say, well, uh, these techniques are more powerful, we just need more regulation. They quote the example of the famous conference in Asilomar Cinema in the 1970s, uh, when the uh, leaders in molecular biology got together to discuss the then new techniques of recombinant DNA. 
and uh, they discussed uh, whether some uh, types of experiments on which they should impose a moratorium, whether some things they should be careful about doing, etc. And uh, they came to an agreement and they were, if anything, overcautious, but they managed to uh, enforce what uh, guidelines they thought were appropriate. And there have been similar groups convened by uh, academies, the Royal Society, the National Academy of Sciences, etc., um, involving some of the same people, people like David Baltimore, who were involved in the older cinema conference, to try and address the risks from CRISPR-Cas9 and those new techniques, and also another new technique called gain of function, where people have shown that you can make the influenza virus, for instance, more virulent or more transmissible. Such experiments were done in Wisconsin and in Holland in uh, 2012, and the US federal government stopped funding them in 2014 because they seemed potentially dangerous. Um, so these new techniques, gain of function and CRISPR-Cas9, um, clearly um, are um, powerful and they have uh, downsides both ethically and prudential. And uh, therefore everyone agrees they need regulation. But the difference between the present state and the older cinema conference in the 1970s is that now the community doing these experiments is far more global and also there are far more commercial pressures. And what makes me very depressed and very anxious is that even if we have these uh, guidelines which are agreed globally, then I don't believe they can be effectively enforced globally any more than the uh, drug laws or the tax laws can be enforced globally. I worry that whatever can be done will be done somewhere by someone. And we can't stop it. We can obviously do what we can to minimize the risk, but we can't stop it. So we need to, uh, to think about what precautions we can take. Now, of course, um, uh, people say, in order to reassure people like me that uh, biological weapons haven't been used by governments uh, because their effects are uncontrollable. And if you are a government with a well-defined aim, or even a terrorist group with a well-defined aim, then you won't want to release some biological pathogen because you don't know who it's going to kill. That may be true, but for just that reason, my worst nightmare is uh, someone um, who is a sort of ecology fanatic with the mindset of some of the extreme animal rights people we had in this country. Someone who thinks that uh, uh, the world, Gaia, is being polluted or destroyed by too many human beings. There are many people who think that, but if there's one person who thought that and had this kind of mindset, then of course they might think it a good idea to try and kill off as many human beings as they can. They wouldn't care who it was. And uh, obviously um, this is unlikely. You need to have someone with this very extreme uh, uh, psychology. But the point is that one such person is too many because the downsides could be so colossal. And I think uh, that that is number one on my, uh, my list of uh, not entirely unrealistic scares. If we look further ahead, then, of course, um, uh, we have to ask how far these techniques will go in, in allowing you to design new species, etc. Um, and that's why I think groups like we have in Cambridge are well set up to use our convening power to get some of the world's best biologists together uh, to uh, try and um, um, brainstorm and see if they can uh, figure out where the boundary is between what is pure science fiction and what might actually happen. Now, of course, they won't be right, but they're more likely to be right if they're working at the frontier than the random person. And that's why I think uh, academic groups like ours and the three or four other similar ones around the world can, I think, be helpful in trying to decide what are the uh, uh, concerns we should focus on and what can we do to uh, minimize those risks. We should do something, but I'm pessimistic because um, these techniques in biology are um, very widely disseminated. I mean, biohacking is a sort of student support sport almost, you know, and it's going to be uh, very possible to to do these sorts of things. And um, in fact, Freeman Dyson, um, in one of his uh, 
articles in New York Review of Books speculates that uh, the next generation of kids may be able to design new species just in the same way as he had a chemistry set and, uh, and made new chemicals. Now, I hope that is science fiction, but if that weren't, then of course um, uh, it may be curtains for us all because you can't, uh, if you t try and mess up the ecology, uh, then that could be dangerous. And indeed, even in the quite short term, there are um, issues being discussed um, related to, um, to these gene modification techniques um, called gene drive, where it's possible to affect the fertility of a particular species and, uh, and w wipe out a species. This has been used um, in a seemingly benign way to uh, um, try and kill off the mosquito species that carries the Zika virus. And uh, if that works, that's fine. Um, but then people are saying, well, um, this should be used to kill the, um, the gray squirrels in England, which are um, dominating the uh, brown squirrels, which everyone likes much better, kill off all the gray squirrels. Now, that may be feasible, but of course, uh, when you mess with um, ecology in that way, there's a non-zero risk of things getting out of control or certainly unintended consequences. So I think, given the power of these new techniques, and the fact that they are going to be usable by literally millions of people with modest equipment, then I think we are going to have a bumpy ride and a growing tension between privacy, uh, security, and liberty, uh, if we want to try and minimize these risks. Uh, I think th th these, are, uh, th these are serious uh, worries, and despite the exciting developments, I, I do worry about um, uh, how we are going to cope uh, with these new developments. Uh, and also, um, I worry that society is fragile as well as being interconnected. And let me give you another example of this. Um, uh, w quite apart from uh, um, biological weapons, uh, natural pandemics, of course, can uh, emerge, you know, and we can try and um, uh, do what we can to uh, preempt them. Um, for instance, if you want to stop pandemic spreading, uh, what we've got to do is to make sure that a Vietnamese farmer notices any strange disease in his pigs or his hens. Uh, we've got to try and minimize those. But, but if a pandemic spreads, then of course um, it will have um, uh, catastrophic consequences, and especially catastrophic because of social consequences. If we think back to earlier pandemics, the, um, uh, the Black Death, or even the, uh, the influenza epidemic in 1919, which killed uh, many millions, um, then, uh, of course, it didn't cause a breakdown of society. Whereas I think now, if we had any kind of pandemic in the UK or the US, then once the number of cases exceeded the capacity of hospitals to cope with, then I think there'd be real risk of social breakdown because people would know that treatment was available but they're not getting it. And I think that sort of uh, pressure and potential breakdown uh, would happen uh, even if only uh, one person in a thousand got infected, just thinking what the capacity of hospitals is. So in that sense, our society is more vulnerable uh, to a pandemic. Um. Of course. There's an interesting sociological question, uh, which is that uh, um, if w there is a pandemic in uh, Mumbai or Lagos or one of these megacities, then it would be terrible. But does the fact that most people have mobile phones make it better or even worse? This, I think, is an important sociological question. You could say it makes it better because advice can be disseminated, etc. But on the other hand, it allows panic and rumour to spread more rapidly. And it's not at all clear, and I don't think it's clear to anyone, what the balance is between those two conflicting effects. But that's just an example of how, in order to minimise the downside of these risks, which we can't reduce to zero, uh, we need to um, uh, think about the social science impact. And, of course, there are many things we can do uh, to, to minimize the risks, even though we can't eliminate them. And we can at least make people conscious. And the other thing which uh, is uh, very much at the forefront of my mind, uh, being based in university, is to try and promote long-term thinking. Because uh, um, uh, at least when we are 
interacting with people aged 20, they may be alive at the end of a century, and so they are going to be more concerned about what may happen towards the end of a century. Um, the technology is not very predictable, but of course, um, uh, environmental changes and climate change, which is not going to be important on a timescale of a decade, is going to be more important then. So they are more concerned with these things. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's very important to sensitize the younger generation and indeed the wider public to these issues. Um, because although, to be fair, many politicians, certainly in this country, are very aware about these long-term threats, the effect of climate change, the risk to biodiversity, etc. Um, they aren't going to prioritize dealing with these unless there's public demand. And even if a science advisor to a minister um, makes the point, and of course we've had good science advisors in this country and the US had John Holder and people like that, uh, they can make these points. But I think the points they raise won't be acted upon unless there's continued public pressure. And that's why I think it's very important that scientists should, um, obviously if they're lucky they can be a scientific advisor, but those advisors have limited impact on political leaders. What politicians care about far more is what's in the inbox and what's in the press. So in a way I think the scientists who have the biggest impact are probably those who go public, those who become media figures, in the Carl Sagan style public figure, and we can think of other examples, um, because they uh, uh, influence a wide public, and that public then does uh, uh, bang on and uh, feeds into the press and to politicians. So I think it's very important that we should, um, on these long-term issues, try and uh, uh, ensure that the, the public is engaged. And of course, those of us in academia uh, can start with our, our students, but we want to go wider than that. And incidentally, I, I think if there's one example where um, even the Catholic Church has had a positive effect because the, um, uh, the Pope produced an encyclical in the summer of uh, 2015 um, where he raised concerns about the uh, risks to biodiversity and to climate uh, from the heavier footprint of the rising human population. And he said for the first time to his flock that humans have a duty to the rest of creation. He didn't take the old attitude that man has dominion over nature. He said uh, something which only Franciscans had really said clearly in the past, which was that uh, um, people did have a obligation to nature. And what everyone thinks of the Catholic Church, one can't um, contest it's got global range, a long-term vision, and concern with the world's poor. And I think that statement, uh, which was spread around the world in the summer of 2015, and the Pope got a five-minute standing ovation at the UN on this, was an important input to the Paris Conference on Climate Change in December in 2015, which was uh, of all those climate conferences, the one where at least there was a consensus. It's limited in its uh, long-term impact, but I think that was an example where the, uh, the public impact in Latin America, East Asia and Africa um, did have a big effect on making a consensus easier to forge in, 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 the, in that context. Um, I personally think it's going to be very hard to uh, get um, people to um, cut down on CO2 emissions because the effect is so diffuse and long term um, uh, if it involves any sort of denial of what they want. And that's why uh, I've been very much behind the campaign to increase the level of research and development into all kinds of carbon-free energy. And uh, another outcome of the Paris Conference led actually uh, initiated by a British group, but led then by America and India together, was to persuade more than 20 countries to double their level of R&D into research, into all kinds of clean energy generation, and into the ancillary technologies of batteries and uh, DC grids and things like that. And the motive for that is that this is exciting. It's hard to think of a more inspiring goal for young engineers than to provide clean, cheap energy for the developing world. But also, um, the more we do the research, and this is 
going to be now funded at a higher level by governments and also incidentally Bill Gates and a group of private philanthropists they uh, they joined and they said they will spend more on this if this succeeds it will speed up the availability of clean non-carbon energy generation at an economical price because as things develop the costs come down and the sooner the costs come down the more realistic it will be for Indians who clearly need to have more electric power so that they don't depend on stoves burning wood and dung, easier for them to leapfrog directed clean energy and not build coal-fired power stations. So I think the most feasible uh, way to um, uh, deal with climate change and CO2 in the long run is to accelerate as much as possible the uh, development of carbon-free energy so that it comes down in costs and everyone will choose to prefer it when it is as cheap as fossil fuels. Um, and we can't predict, of course, which future technology will come up which will surprise us just as much as the, uh, the iPhone did in the past. Um, and uh, uh, we can't predict either which will be taken up. Because there are, of course, cases where technologies allow things to happen, but there's no demand. I mean, to take an example, supersonic airliners. Uh, um, you know, 50 years ago, some people might have thought that we'd all be flying supersonically, whereas we're flying more or less the same way as we were 50 years ago, um, for reasons we can understand. Uh, there was no uh, um, economic pressure for supersonic flight. And so there are examples, and of course manned space flight's another example, where governments fund it in the past but don't now. So it's not the case that all technologies are developed but some are and some are developed and run away at a huge rate and those who control those runaway technologies are in a very powerful position and how we're going to cope with that is something which is a big challenge for all of us.